Thank you all. The, um, the Archbishop, the former Archbishop of Louisville, Archbishop Kurtz, he always used to say when people clapped at the beginning of a talk, it was an act of faith. <laughs> I subscribe to that very much. I'll also say the last time I spoke at an Endice conference was at Xavier um, many years ago. And as I was driving home, I had just crossed the bridge into Kentucky and um, a driver came onto the interstate ahead of me, crossed all four lanes and got right in front of me going 40 miles per hour and slammed on her brakes. And we didn't have an accident, but the police officer stopped me and gave me a $230 ticket for following too closely. As a liturgist, I've never been accused of following too closely. <laughs> so if, um, if I uh, veer into the ridiculous or the impossible during my talk today, partly that is because as of July 1st, I am rector of our cathedral here and pastor of Blessed Sacrament and Queen of Peace, all three of which parishes have schools, and I am the diocesan director of the Office of Worship. So, um, just a little bit to do. When I came here, um, I came to be a rector of the cathedral, and then right before I got here, Bishop uh, McGovern said to me, I think you're going to be the director of the Office of Worship, too, okay? <laughs> I guess so. Anyway, um, it, it's my pleasure, really, to be here. Uh, I, I became the director of deacon formation at St. Meinrad in 2002. Um, and worked uh, for eight years with 15 different dioceses throughout the United States. And I um, was, was very happy to do that, among other administrative jobs, and teaching liturgy in the seminary. You have not lived until you teach liturgy in the seminary. <laughs> so what I'll be doing today and tomorrow, um, besides boring you all to death, is... <laughs> I hope not, um, is, is focusing my comments on a document that Pope Benedict XVI brought uh, to light in 2007 called Sacramentum Caritatis. That document, the Sacrament of Charity, um, in my view, answers a whole lot of questions that a whole lot of people have in our day. Well, Father Godfrey, what are we doing for this Eucharistic revival in the parish? And you haven't provided us a program yet. No, I'm working on it, along with 17,000 other things. But, in a way, I am a firm believer that Pope Benedict already did the work for us. He's already given us the program of Eucharistic revival. And for that, I am very grateful. Um, I'm not going to tell you probably a whole lot of things that you don't already know, but I hope I'm putting them together in a new way so that it can help us all to be more appreciative of the incredible gift that the Eucharist is for each and every one of us. I'd like to start with a passage from Scripture from the first book of Kings. After some time, however, the wadi ran dry because no rain had fallen in the land. So the word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow there to feed you. He arose and went to Zarephath. When he arrived at the entrance of the city, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called out to her, please bring me a small cup full of water to drink. She left to get it, and he called out after her, please bring along a crust of bread. She said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. There is only a handful of flour in my jar and a little oil in my jug. Just now, I was collecting a few sticks to go in and prepare something for myself and my son. When we have eaten it, we shall die.
Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake and bring it to me. Afterwards you can prepare something for yourself and your son. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The jar of flour shall not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, until the day when the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She left and did as Elijah had said. She had enough to eat for a long time, he and she and her household. The jar of flour did not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord spoken through Elijah. I am fairly certain that many of the new deacons of the Diocese of Belleville are very afraid that I am about to give a talk that I gave them on their retreat just a few months ago right now. But you all paid good money for this, right? <laughs> or your parish did, or somebody did. I'm not going to give you the same talk, but I am using that same passage of Scripture. I believe that, that this passage from the Old Testament teaches us that undying, important lesson that we all need to learn time and time again. That when we trust in the living Lord, when we know that the Lord himself will feed us and give us hope and strength and all that we need to carry out not just the ministry that we've been given, but the life that we've been given to live. I think the widow of Zarephath teaches us that incredibly important lesson that Jesus is the one who will show us the way that God gives us the grace that we need that we will find our way if we turn to him. I can't imagine answering the request of Elijah when he says, when she has nothing at all, go in and fix me something to eat. My mother has had Alzheimer's for the last five years. She's no longer verbal. But in her day, had Elijah said to the mother of five children, go in and fix me something to eat even though you don't have enough for your family, my mother would have certainly told him that that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Prophet or not, that would never have happened. And yet the widow of Zarephath in some ways has very little choice. What does she have except that little bit to offer and so she offers it. And in offering it, like when Jesus lifts up a few loaves and a few fish, people eat for a long, long time. The widow of Zarephath trusts the word of the prophet and finds in the bread that she herself makes the fruit of the earth and the work of human hands, she finds in that bread enough to sustain her and her household. And this incredibly demanding um, guest of hers. Am I tearing it up? Some of you know my theory that um, the devil lives in church sound systems. So today, I'm here to spend the next three and a half hours with you. No, I am kidding. <laughs> the next 30 minutes or so, talking about the first two sections of Pope Benedict's document, Sacramentum Caritatis. What I'll be doing is using pieces from that document and tying them to the words of the ordination rite for the ordination of a deacon. And so my hope is to show us that Eucharistic revival is not a program that the diocesan director of the Office of Worship is going to concoct, but in fact, the Eucharistic revival, as with everything, as Pope Francis teaches us time and again, starts first of all with the work of accompaniment. I have to know the beauty of Christ present in the bread consecrated, the wine poured out as his blood 
What I have to learn, of course, is that I have to receive him. Pope Benedict so wisely talks about the Eucharist being a mystery to be believed, to be celebrated, and to be lived. And it's my very strong opinion that the mystery to be lived is a particularly diaconal ministry. And that's what I'll talk about tomorrow. Today, I want to set the groundwork for that, all the while focusing on the work of the deacon. Today, I want to, to talk about believing and celebrating the mystery that is having Eucharistic faith. Pope Benedict says in the second paragraph of Sacramentum Caritatis, in the sacrament of the Eucharist, Jesus shows us in particular the truth about the love which is the very essence of God. Pope Benedict is clear in teaching us that the Eucharist shows us true love given to us as God in the person of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing for us to consider. I would say, as someone who, before I was ordained, I was the choir master at the monastery, and before that, assistant choir master. For many years, I have never had the freedom to sit in a chair during mass, or even the liturgy of the hours, and be fed by others, because I have work to do. I have to preach, or preside, or sing, or do something. And I think when I do that, I run the very strong risk of trying to feed people like the widow of Zarephath, but with an empty jar. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to give because I will not allow myself to be fed. Pope Benedict goes on to say in paragraph 5 that the purpose of his document, listen carefully to these amazing words, is to offer some basic directions aimed at a renewed commitment to Eucharistic enthusiasm and fervor in the church. Now you all thought that our bishops are brilliant and came up with this idea three years ago of a Eucharistic revival all on their own. Yeah, 2007. Pope Benedict is calling for this renewed commitment to Eucharistic enthusiasm and fervor. It just took our bishops about 16 years to get there. All right? No criticism intended by saying that, that if you've ever gone to a bishop's meeting, <laughs> that they ever get to anything together is pretty amazing. <laughs> His goal in 2007 is our goal in 2023. Eucharistic enthusiasm and fervor from reflection on our belief, on our celebration, and our life as Eucharistic people. If that's not a call to Eucharistic revival, I don't know what is. And as we prepare for that work in this period in the life of the church, it seems to me that what we start to see very clearly is that the Eucharist has to sit at the center of what we do. Does that mean that I must do the same thing every time I celebrate the Eucharist? No, it does not. I was on retreat about three weeks ago, and for three days in a row, I walked into the chapel of the sisters where I was staying, and another priest of my monastery, it was outside of Washington, D.C., but he's a student at Catholic University, he had mass each day. And I could actually walk in, and I know this will sound crazy, I could just pray. And again, it awakened within me this whole need that we have to somehow find a way to be fed. So when Pope Benedict talks about believing and celebrating the mystery and developing our Eucharistic faith, what does he mean? Well, in short, I think the question for us then first is, what is it that we believe about the Eucharist? Now, I am not a scholar of sociological studies, 
And I don't really know, to be honest, how accurate and helpful these latest Pew survey results are. But I do know that there are a lot of liturgical scholars and there are a lot of others who love to quote all of these different studies that prove that Catholics don't know what the real presence is, that prove that Catholics don't believe that Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. But I dare you to walk up to an 85-year-old parishioner at a daily mass and say, could you please explain to me what transubstantiation is? And suggest by the fact that he or she does not have the language of the Summa Theologica ready at hand, that she doesn't know that she is receiving the body and blood of Christ. I dare you, because my hunch is in most places, you will get clocked. <laughs> I don't find those surveys convincing because of my 12 years now of experience in parish ministry. I see the reverence that so many people have when they walk up. I also see people who aren't so reverent. But I can't say that 90% of people aren't reverent when they come up to receive Holy Communion. What is it that we're supposed to believe? Are we supposed to believe in transubstantiation? Well, of course we are. Is that the only gauge of Eucharistic faith? If it is, and please, Deacon Boyer, don't tell the bishop this, but I quit. If that's the only measure, I'm done. Because I would say that the measure of our charity is a much more reliable measure of our belief in the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. I would say that our commitment to justice is a bigger measure of our belief in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Our willingness to love God above all and neighbor as self a greater measure. But that doesn't make headlines. And that isn't quite as interesting as Catholics don't believe in the real presence. And so what is it that Pope Benedict thinks we should believe as we set out to enhance Eucharistic enthusiasm and fervor? He starts where I would never start a curriculum for a deacon formation program with the Trinity. I would, I would definitely put that towards the tail end of deacon formation. Get them a little scripture, get them a little dogmatic theology, then we can talk about the Trinity. And then we'll always, almost always, ask the deacon to preach on Trinity Sunday. It's always a good idea. Pope Benedict says that Jesus gives us himself and that God is a perfect communion of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Imagine what our Eucharistic fervor would look like if we would just keep that in mind. That Christ is perfectly the outpouring of love to the people of God. The pure mercy of the Most High and that the perfect communion of their love is given to us first in the person of Jesus Christ, and now through the power of the Holy Spirit. He talks about Jesus being the sacrificial lamb in paragraph 9, and he says, God's freedom and our freedom meet definitively in an inviolable, eternally valid pact in the Eucharist. It doesn't expire, thanks be to God. Perhaps when we talk about the sacrificial lamb and freedom, these words might rightly come to mind. Do you promise respect and obedience to me and my successors? I had a young priest say to me a few, few weeks ago, you know, I've been ordained three years, and I thought celibacy was going to be the toughest part of all. And I then thought maybe obedience would be the toughest part of all. And then I learned that it's that respect piece that is the hardest thing of all 
when the bishop moves me when I'm not ready to be moved. Pack your bags, nitwit. You said it. Go. <laughs> For years, when I taught in the seminary, 14 years of that, I would say to the seminarians that nothing brings us more freedom than our promise of obedience. I don't have to worry about what my assignment is. That's the bishop's job. That's the abbot's job. I don't have to worry about what I should do next. That's the bishop's job. And so there is incredible freedom that comes from our promise of obedience. There is incredible freedom that comes with a willingness not only to obey a bishop, a human being, but to obey God in all that we do. God who gave us the lamb who was obedient even unto death, death on a cross. Pope Benedict goes on to talk about in paragraph 10, the institution of the Eucharist, of course, the Last Supper. He talks about that at least in some of the sources, that happened during the celebration of the deliverance of Israel from their slavery in Egypt, the Passover meal. He talks about this Passover being deliverance from slavery. And I think it's easy for us to think of Passover as a purely historical event. Way long ago, Moses, as we heard this morning, was born and was put in the little basket. And you know the rest of the story. Have you had mass yet today? Yeah, okay, you're good, you're good. I did that already twice this morning, and it was just as boring to them the second time as it was the first time. But I also think we have to imagine the many ways we find ourselves and the beloved people we serve enslaved today by ideology or politics or theological polarity or food or pornography or inappropriate sexual activity, or electronics, or social media, or video games, or gossip, or disrespect, or abortion, or hatred, or bigotry, or moral laxity, or jealousy, or consumerism. And I could really go on because I hear confessions. We find ourselves enslaved not by the wickedness necessarily of another person, but by our own choice. And in fact, the deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt was made complete in our deliverance from slavery to sin by the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. If we want to reinvigorate our Eucharistic enthusiasm and fervor, helping people understand that the Eucharist is our ticket out of slavery, our ticket out of oppression in Egypt, then we've got something to tell them. And better yet, we have someone to offer them. Not Moses the murderer who hid from Pharaoh, but Jesus, the one who was murdered in broad daylight and brought new life to the world. But Benedict goes on to speak about the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit makes Christ present and active in his church, starting with the center, which is the Eucharist. He says this many times in Sacramentum Caritatis, that the Eucharist is the center of the church's life and mission. And like every good pope, he didn't dream that up himself. Stolen wholesale, right out of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy from the Second Vatican Council. Source and summit, font and power of the church is the Eucharist. I dare you, I dare you to tell the athletic club at your school that the Eucharist, and not basketball, is the center of life in the church. You let me know how that goes. Consecrated for the church's ministry by the laying on of hands and the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Yes, in the sacrament of confirmation, we receive those seven gifts. But for those who are ordained, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself is given to us for the good of the church. We realize then that in the Eucharist, it is the work of the Holy Spirit that we seek to do. Years ago, when I was still a student at Catholic U, I was walking through a church in a suburb of Washington, D.C., and a newly ordained priest, who I am proud to say was not trained at St. Mine Red, was giving a tour to second graders of the church, and he was standing at the altar, and he was explaining to them what went on at the altar. And he looked at the kids, and he said, and this is the part of Mass where I turn the, the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And I said to my friend Linda, get a look, because without intending to blaspheme, there is the Holy Spirit. She said, what are you talking about? And I said, the Holy Spirit changes bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And he just said he did it, so that must be the Holy Spirit. <laughs> At your ordination, the bishop also said, send forth upon them, Lord, we pray, the Holy Spirit that they may be strengthened by the gift of your sevenfold grace for the faithful carrying out of the work of the ministry. We never minister alone. And when we feel alone, count it always as temptation. The Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus Christ, crucified and raised from the dead, our brother and our savior, that presence always accompanies us. Pope Benedict goes on to talk in four, paragraph 14 about the church and the Eucharist. And he says, again, the church draws her life from the Eucharist. Again, never is that clearer to me than when I walk into a hospital room and I offer the person who is dying the sacrament of viaticum and say those sweet, beautiful words about the forgiveness of all their sins. I've never seen anything more comforting to a person in my life than knowledge that their sins are forgiven as they are preparing to meet their Savior. The church and ecclesial communion is the next topic that Pope Benedict talks about in paragraph 15. He talks about that in Christian antiquity, the phrase Corpus Christi was designated as Christ's body born of Mary, the human person, fully human and fully divine. It was also used to designate his Eucharistic body. It was also used to designate his ecclesial body. The body of Christ, the body of Christ, the body of Christ, true in all three ways. He speaks about this indicating our oneness and our indivisibility. My brothers and sisters, if there is one way that the church has grown very proficient in giving scandal to the world in the 21st century, it is far more the polarity of our ugliness than it is anything else. Not excluding the ugliness of the sexual abuse scandals, I can honestly say that I think people are more confused by our ugly polarity in the church than they are by almost anything else. And yet, the body of Christ is called to oneness and indivisibility. Am I working for that unity? Or am I working against it? And if I'm working against it, no matter how well intended I am, I think I have to realize that I am countering the body of Christ. Pope Benedict says in these words, from this Eucharistic perspective adequately understood, ecclesial communion is seen to be Catholic by its very nature. Unity in the church is not some idea that Pope Francis dreamt up. It is in fact very much the demand and the expectation of our Savior who founded the church. I think we have to be very careful when we go against ecclesial communion, however that looks 
whether that's in the parish, in a committee meeting, or publicly in other ways, we have to realize that, that is not why we have been ordained, and it is not why we are called to ministry. Do you resolve to conform your way of life always to the example of Christ, of whose body and blood you are ministers at the altar, and you responded rightly, I am, with the help of God. And we will find that unity only with the help of God. May God, who appointed you stewards of his mysteries, make you imitators of his son, Jesus Christ, and ministers of unity and peace in the world. Another quote from the Ordination Liturgy of Deacons. Something that I think, again, beautiful for us who strive to do what we're called. Pope Benedict goes on to speak in paragraph 16 about the Eucharist and the other sacraments. All the sacraments, he says, and all ecclesiastical ministries, everything, including the basketball team and works of the apostolate, are bound up with the Eucharist and are directed towards it. Why does he just say that? For youth ministers, this is one of the scariest lines. So are you serious that my trip to Six Flags has something to do with the Eucharist? Do you think we should start with Mass before we go? Well, I don't think that's the only way that your trip to Six Flags should have something to do with the Eucharist. Let's talk about ecclesial unity. Let's talk about our call to celebrate the sacraments. During the Litany of the Saints at the ordination of deacons, we hear these simple and gorgeous words, bless sanctify and consecrate these chosen men. Bless them and sanctify them and consecrate them. Then he goes on uh, an expl explication of all of the sacraments and their connection to the Eucharist. I encourage you to read those on your own time, which is my nice way of saying now I'm skipping ahead. In paragraph 30, he talks about Eucharist and eschatology. The goal, of course, is that Christ, who conquered sin and death, makes himself present in the Eucharist. Do I find him there? Do I seek him there? And for those of us who preach, do I point him out there? For those of us who teach, do I show him to others there? And as the hungry, do I find him there, the answer to all my hungers? Finally, in this section, he talks about the Eucharist and the Blessed Virgin Mary. He says, Mary places herself confidently in God's hands, abandoning herself to his will. Brothers and sisters, I don't think abandoning ourselves to God's will is particularly popular in our day. And I believe but the polarity of which I have already spoken is a result of our unwillingness to listen to the will of God and our willingness to do our will instead of his. How do we confidently place ourselves in God's hands and abandon ourselves to his will? I have broken one of my own rules not because I've gone over time, I still, I still have a little bit of time, but um, I have said hundreds of times that if I'm ever asked to give a talk on the Eucharist, I will always start in the same place. Sacrosanctum Concilium, in paragraph 47. At the Last Supper on the night when he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood. He did this in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the centuries until he should come again. And so to entrust to his beloved spouse, the church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is eaten, the mind is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given to us. If you want ever to teach a course on the Eucharist, Take every word that I emphasized in my reading of that paragraph 
and give about three weeks worth of talks. And I don't mean one hour a week. I mean all week long. And you might get to the tip of the iceberg of Eucharistic theology. But if we're going to increase Eucharistic enthusiasm and fervor, then it seems to me, in all honesty, we have to keep coming back to all of these foundational truths about the Eucharist. That Jesus was altogether willing to sacrifice himself. That somehow all of that took place in his death and resurrection. That when we gather to pray and sing, we understand that we are celebrating a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, and a paschal banquet. We have to understand, of course we do, that Christ is eaten, and that the mind is filled with grace, and that a pledge of future glory is given to us. If we just remembered that last piece, here is our future glory. Here is everything that he promised to us and for us. Here, when I stretch out my hungry, needy hands that are unwilling to clench themselves around all that I desire to hold on to, but when I spread those hands open and empty to the one who fulfills all my needs, well, then there will be fervor then there will be enthusiasm. Because instead of a turkey or chicken sandwich fulfilling our hungers, the Lord of the living who sacrificed himself and was raised from the dead begins to satisfy all that we long for. And that would be a perfect place to end this talk, but I still have another page. Hang on. <laughs> when we celebrate... How do we celebrate? Now, I will tell you, this is a, a strong temptation for me. Um, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the meaning of participation in the recorded uh, talks that were given at the National Liturgical Weeks from 1940 until 1962. Anybody have insomnia? Because for about 45 bucks, I can cure it for you. I will gladly send you a copy of my dissertation, and you could read that and cry yourself to sleep every night. But I think participation is an important element of where we have lost the way sometimes in the liturgy. Pope Benedict talks about the fact that faith and Eucharist start with a Paschal mystery. We can't begin to understand what we celebrate at the Mass unless we understand that Christ took flesh, suffered, and died, and was raised for our sake. We've got to start there. He goes on to say that liturgy is the splendor of truth. So often, truth is that bludgeoning stick that I hit over the heads of people who disagree with me. But in fact, the splendor of truth is the presence of Christ himself. And we must take great care to celebrate the Eucharist in a way that shows the splendor of truth. Eucharist is the work of the whole Christ. And there is a profound unity between ourselves and Christ when we celebrate. It's one of the things that I am very, very careful about when it looks like the Eucharist belongs again simply to the clergy, then we're in trouble. Because there were a whole lot of people who gave a whole lot of time and effort to prove that this is my sacrifice and yours. And that's an important part of what we do. It is celebrated on the Lord's Day because it is the day of the resurrection. Pope Benedict uses this curious phrase that some liturgical theologians have spent hours and hours talking about throughout the United States, ars celebrandi, that is the art of celebration, or some would say the art of proper celebration. And he says that the art of proper celebration is full conscious and active participation among the faithful and faithful adherence to liturgical norms. Spoken like a true liturgist ahead with the rubrics. The Ars Celebrande, he says, goes on, he goes on to say, it fosters a sense of the sacred and uses outward signs so that people might understand what we are about. 
everything related to the Eucharist should be marked by beauty. Now, we have nice chalices, we have nice patents, we have decent music in many places. Listen to that line again, thinking about our homilies. Everything related to the Eucharist should be marked by beauty. I can tell you after 29 years as a priest and a year before that as a deacon, that not all the homilies have been beautiful. In fact, some of them quite the opposite. And I'm ashamed of that. I should work towards a beautiful homily every time I preach. Song is an expression of joy and love and is to be integrated into the liturgy. Now, paragraph 46 should have appeared on the page of the New York Times, but it did not. Those of you who remember 2007, did you hear that Pope Benedict XVI said, without qualification, that the quality of homilies needs to be improved? No, nobody heard it. Nobody heard it. And yet he said it bluntly in a post simple apostolic exhortation. Remember these words. Receive the gospel of Christ, whose herald you have become. Believe what you read. Teach what you believe. And practice what you teach. Our homilies should be a beautiful, beautiful testimony of God's word made flesh in our day. The dismissal, he goes on to say in paragraph 51, has its relationship between mass celebrated and the Christian mission in the world as its starting point. One of my favorite things to talk about. Do you know why the deacon dismisses the people? As I love to say, because the priest is out of gas. <laughs> There's no way he could possibly be expected to say, go in peace after all of that. The deacon dismisses the people because his people are not there. They are in hospital beds and in their homes and alienated by marriage and remarriage and divorce in between. And they are in prison cells and they are lost in drug addiction and they are not present at mass. And the deacon says to the people of God, come with me, because we have the body of Christ to gather in. And it is time for us to bring them back, or at least to be the presence of Christ for them. The only reason for the last 29 years that I have the right at all to dismiss the people at the end of Mass is because I was ordained a deacon first. That's who dismisses the people from the gathering of the body of Christ. Authentic to say uh, is not eternal activity. I really talked too long if I had to go to the third microphone. <laughs> it's only been 35 minutes. <laughs> Hi. Okay. okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. What did I say about church sound systems? <laughs> okay, um, finally, authentic participation is not merely an external activity, he says in 52, a heart reconciled, active participation in the life of the church as a whole, and the missionary commitment to bring Christ's love into society. That's what authentic participation in the liturgy is about. Not simply opening a drive-through window where I can come and receive the consecrated host, but hearing his word, experiencing his body in the people gathered to pray and sing, and living the life that we have been called to live. To my knowledge, it is the first official document of any pope that says in paragraph 64 that there is a greater need for mystagogical catechesis. <laughs> wow, okay. And for all of us, I think that's a challenge. How do I continue to unfold the mysteries for God's holy people? Finally, in paragraph 66, he says, there is an intrinsic relationship between celebration 
and adoration. And that, of course, is something that I think we have to be careful about. Because sometimes we celebrate and don't adore, and other times we want adoration with no connection to celebration. And that won't work either. And so I think we have to find, find our way. And Deacon Steve, I know I owe you an email on that. It'll happen, I promise. It'll be after tomorrow at noon. In paragraph 352 of the General Instruction of the Roman Missal, it says, in planning the celebration, then, the priest should, could, should consider the common spiritual good of the people of God rather than be concerned about his own inclinations. Priests don't like that. All right? I'm going to do what I like to do. Deacons aren't like that, are Oh, <clears throat> The greater spiritual good of the people of God is what we're about, always and everywhere. That's our, that's our, our goal. In paragraph 14 of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, we hear Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. Such participation by the Christian people as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people is their right and their duty by reason of their baptism. We have not begun to make that clear. We still have passive spectators at the liturgy who want nothing to do with full conscious and active participation. One of my least favorite liturgical moments. I'll be at the altar. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Now, my mother would have smacked me for that. If somebody said something to me and I had my face in a book, my mother would smack me for that. Now, it's holy. And yet, my question is, are we paying attention to what we're doing? Are we actively participating in the life of the church? And I would say that's hard to see. Also, in Sacrosanctum Concilium, paragraph 7, to accomplish so great a work, Christ is always present in his church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. He is present in the sacrifice of the Mass, not only in the person of his minister, the same now offering through the ministry of priests who formerly offered himself on the cross, but especially under the Eucharistic species. By his power, he is present in the sacraments, so that when a man baptizes, it is really Christ himself who baptizes. He is present in his word, since it is he himself who speaks when the holy scriptures are read in the church. And he is present, lastly, when the church prays and sings. For he promised where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Several months ago, at a Saturday evening mass, I walked up the aisle of the cathedral, which if you haven't been there, it is worth a visit. It's a beautiful place. With all due respect to the people of Chicago, the cathedral of the Diocese of Belleville is the largest cathedral in the state of Illinois. Ha! <laughs> No, I don't even know what I was saying. <laughs> I'm walking up that long aisle. It make, makes us very popular for weddings. And almost no one had the hymnal even open. And the cathedral's a bit oddly arranged. It was 1968. Don't, don't blame me. I was only two. But a third of the cathedral are pews behind the sanctuary that face forward. And the other two-thirds of the seating faces the sanctuary from the other side. Very odd, but that's the way it is. And I get up to the front where my chair is, three and a half miles from the people in the front pew. <laughs> and all of the people in the back pews, and I don't know why they sit there, but they do. Not one has a book open. And so I took my hymnal and I went, let's sing. Oh, oh. One lady left the parish, right, Josie? 
yes. And one lady called in and her faith was shaken. Wow. So I guess Christ isn't really present when the church prays and sings because they don't sing. No, they do. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I'm going to end with one last quote. May God, who has called you to the service of others in his church, give to you a great zeal for all, especially the poor and the suffering. If we are to be believers in the person of Jesus Christ, then we must believe that he is present. We must believe that he leads us and doesn't desert us. And we must celebrate that presence with joy every single time we gather for the Eucharist. And if the day comes when there is not joy in our hearts, when there is not willingness to celebrate, when there's no energy in the proclamation, when there is no application in the homily, when there is no beauty in the liturgy, then it is time for us to go on retreat and to find what we have lost and to bring that to the ministry that we are privileged to undertake in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Sorry. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would it be easier for you all if I had a PowerPoint presentation tomorrow? I'm willing to put one together, but if it wouldn't be a big help. Okay, great, good. Thank you for saving me an hour. God bless you all. Enjoy the evening and uh, know that you have been in the prayers of the people of uh, the center of Belleville and the west end of Belleville. The rest of them, I'm sorry. <laughs> but enjoy your evening and um, I'll see you tomorrow morning. God bless you all.